Today I want to talk about the DASH project with you and our research at Stanford involved in the building of scalable shared memory machines. We'll start by talking about some of the general challenges as well as some of the advantages of a scalable shared memory machine. And then in the second half of the talk, move into actually discussing the DASH architecture and the concepts behind that architecture. Before starting, let's discuss a little bit the goals in designing a parallel machine. I think probably the first goal is the obvious one, namely one would like high performance out of a parallel machine, faster than available unit processors. The second goal, which we think is quite important, is that the cost performance of a multiprocessor be competitive with the cost performance of workstations that use the microprocessor technology available. Obviously, scalability has been something that people in parallel processing have talked about extensively. And one would like to have scalable performance in a multiprocessor as well as scalable cost performance. Finally, uh, a goal that we've considered very important in our research is to design machines which are general purpose, which have wide applicability to a range of applications. We think each one of these points is important in trying to make parallel processors pervasive, in getting to the point where we all, as a computing community, choose to use parallel processors because they're a better and faster way to solve our problems. The term scalability has been used to mean a whole variety of things. And I think it's helpful to mention what some of those definitions are and to say what we mean by scalability. One definition of scalability is what I would call an impractical definition. It, it states that scalability is either uh, speed up on a constant size problem across a range of machines, or even speed up on scale problems, which for practical machines, machines that can be implemented, uh, is unattainable. A second definition for scalability would be realistic in the sense that we could asymptotically approach that performance, but might disregard cost and might disregard constant factors, which in practice uh, would make the machine perhaps scalable, but uninteresting from a cost viewpoint. What we mean by scalability and the definition we've used in our project is a, a very pragmatic definition of scalability. Our interest is in spe good speed up and good scalable cost across a range of parameters for a machine. In particular, what I'm going to talk about today are ideas which are interesting in the range of tens to low thousands of processors. What's required to build a scalable multiprocessor? Well, obviously, we must scale both bandwidth and do something about the scaling of latency. We'll return to this topic of latency shortly. Let's just focus on bandwidth for now. When we say we must scale bandwidth, that means that we have to be able to scale the local memory bandwidth, the bandwidth that each processor demands linearly. And we also have to have a way to scale the communication bandwidth between processors as we scale the, the size of the machine. An important observation is that scaling the memory bandwidth requires the use of physically distributed memories. It's inherent. There's no cost-efficient way to scale up a machine and scale up the memory bandwidth without physically distributing the memory. I also want to point out that if you want to achieve scalable cost performance, you've got to take advantage of the best price performance available in processors. That means using state-of-the-art microprocessors. And I think we can see this trend evidenced in various recently announced machines, the CM5, for example, that chose to use an off-the-shelf microprocessor rather than build a custom processor for the machine. Once one has decided to use a distributed memory, a physically distributed memory, there are two interesting architectural alternatives. One is a message passing machine where the memories are private and communication between processors is done by explicitly passing messages. A second alternative, and the one we're going to discuss in some detail in this talk, is a machine that has physically separated memories but has a single address space across all those memories. 
it's important to observe that either approach requires you to deal with locality of access. Because the memories are physically distributed, people have to pay attention, programmers have to pay attention to, the, to locality of access. Both these approaches also require a scalable interconnection technology, which allows us to scale up the bandwidth between the processors. Given that, why do we find a single address space approach attractive? Well, there are both functional and performance advantages. The functional advantages, one of the most important, is that a single address space is easier to program in and easier to build compilers for. It's easier to program for because it's a better understood programming model. And it's easier to build compilers for because the compilers can treat the single address space and the memory, this physically distributed memory, as an optimization problem. There's also, as we'll see in this talk, the opportunity to create an incremental program development methodology whereby a programmer can relatively easily port a program to this machine and can regard the process of enhancing performance as an incremental process whereby the issues of locality of access are addressed as an optimization problem, a performance enhancement problem, as opposed to a uh, correctness or fundamental problem getting the program working. With a little bit of hardware help, a single address space machine can also efficiently simulate other models. There are also performance advantages associated with a single address space approach. One of the most important of these is that small data objects can be communicated more efficiently between processors. And that's because that communication is integrated in the memory model. A second advantage is that it's easier to exploit caching. And we'll see that this is the backbone of much of the work that we've done at Stanford. As one scales up the machine size, the latency to access remote memories increases. This increase is unavoidable. For example, if we were to look at how that latency scales up in machines today, we'd see as typical numbers, the local cache access time might typically on a processor today take one cycle. Accessing lo local memory might take anywhere from 10 to 40 cycles. Accessing a remote memory, having to go across an interconnection network, might take anywhere from 50 to 200 cycles. And remote access that might have to actually require trapping to the operating system or some other software library might take as many as 1,000 or, in fact, up to 10,000 cycles. This remote access time scaling is unavoidable if we want to allow the machine to scale up to large numbers of processors. How do we deal with this long latency? There are three ways, and fundamental ways, in which we can deal with it. The first is we can lower the frequency of long latency events. By using better parallel algorithms or better implementations of parallel algorithms, we can actually have the programmer lower the frequency of long latency events and thereby improve the performance of a program. A second approach is to try to reduce the latency by the use of hardware techniques. For example, we try and make the access to remote objects cheaper. A third approach is to tolerate latency. That is, find some way to overlap computation and communication so that the impact of latency on performance is minimized. Let's talk about reducing latency. One of the most important methods for trying to reduce latency is to eliminate the long latency accesses by the use of caching. Caching is a time-honored idea that has been used in architecture for a long time and been extremely useful in trying to reduce latency. When we introduce caching, we can introduce it either as a hardware technique or as a software technique. And of course, the static versus dynamic behavior of the application affects the suitability of using a software technique, which might be more appropriate in a static environment, or a hardware technique, which might be more appropriate in a dynamic environment. We can also reduce the communication latency by the use of low latency, high bandwidth protocols. 
Those will both avoid contention and reduce latency. This is an area where there's been dramatic progress and where it appears that there will continue to be important progress in interconnection networks. As we said earlier, we can also tolerate latency. One obvious way to tolerate latency is in a message passing machine where the programmer has the task of overlapping computation and communication. Another way to tolerate latency is by changing the memory model. The memory model specifies when a processor can continue after doing a load or a store, for example, and when it can assume that access is completed. By relaxing the memory model, we allow the processor to continue earlier, allowing it to ignore the fact that a store, for example, may take quite a long time to propagate across an entire machine. Two other ways to tolerate latency are through prefetching and multiple context. In prefetching, the programmer or the compiler actually inserts instructions into the program which have the effect of bringing data from a remote location to a nearby location, thereby reducing its access time. In multiple context, we actually design the machine so that when a long latency event occurs, the processor context switches to another thread of execution thereby overlapping that long latency event with the other thread of execution. It's important to observe that all latency tolerating techniques require extra parallelism to be available in the program because they overlap these long latency events with that extra parallelism. They also generate extra bandwidth demands on the machine by doing prefetching or multiple context we increase the bandwidth demands that the process requires on that particular program. Let's return to the topic of caching and cache coherency. There are several alternatives we could look at in a single address space uh, with respect to the use of caching and whether or not the caches should be kept coherent with hardware assistance. One approach would be to say, Let's not cache shared data. And as we'll see, the that will make the accesses to remote data very expensive. A second related alternative is that we cache shared data but under software control. In that case, we're limited by the ability of the software to do the job perfectly. By that we mean that if the software cannot be certain that it can cache a local copy and still retain a consistent programming model, and a consistent memory model for the programmer, then the software must be conservative, must not choose to make a cached copy, and must use the remote copy. And that becomes the limiting factor in trying to cache in software. What would an architecture with private caches that did not attempt to cache shared data look like? Well, that architecture might well have caches, but the caches would contain only private data. Therefore, accesses to remote data would have to go through the caches over the interconnection network and to the remote memory. Some examples of these kinds of machines are the IBM RP3 and the BBM Butterfly. These machines feature, as we see here, a distributed memory and may even use caches. There's also a single address space across those distributed memories. They also need to make use of a scalable interconnection network. This slide shows why this approach runs into difficulties. The frequency of shared accesses, that is what percentage of the memory accesses made by the processor are to shared data, is quite large, often in the range of 35 to 40 percent of the accesses made by the program. That means for example, in a machine with caches that cache only private data, that 35 to 40 percent of the memory accesses are going to take on the order of 100 cycles. Obviously, the penalty for this and the effect on speed up would be quite dramatic. Now, there's actually good news in these sorts of measurements. And one element of good news is that the shared read frequency tends to be much higher than the shared write frequency. That's good news because from the point of view of a cache designer, that means the caching will probably work quite well. 
So a third alternative to designing a machine with a single address space is to design cache coherency into the hardware. The key question is, can that cache mechanism, can that coherency mechanism be made to scale? This chart shows how conventional cache coherency has traditionally been implemented using what's typically called a Snoopy bus. In this scheme, the processors are connected onto the single bus. When a cache miss occurs, that miss is placed on the bus, and the caches snoop to try to determine whether or not they might contain the data required by the processor. If one of those caches contains the data, then it places the data on the bus, and the processor which generated the initial cache miss finds the data present there. When a processor writes a shared data item, that data item is placed on the bus, the address of that data item, and an invalidation is generated on the bus so that the copies of the data resident in the other caches are eliminated by that invalidation. A good way to think about this is that what a Snoopy bus protocol presents is a solution to the multiple readers, single writer problem. We allow multiple people to read and copy the data item into their cache. When we want to write the data item, we invalidate all those caches so that there's only a single copy that can be written and updated. Now, if we try and ask what's the problem with a Snoopy-based protocol, the major problem is that when a cache miss occurs, we must broadcast that address on the bus and require all the caches to snoop to see whether or not they have that particular address. An important observation here is that this is an inherent feature of this protocol. It is not a property that can be eliminated just by making the bus faster or by even putting two buses in. Because the limitation that oc will occur will be that the bandwidth of the caches that are used for snooping will quickly saturate. And therefore, we can't extend the machine purely by increasing the amount of bus bandwidth. Let me talk about an alternative to this Snoopy-based approach that enables us to have a cache coherency scheme that will scale. This alternative is a cache coherency scheme called directories. In a directory-based scheme, we have an object called a directory, which keeps track of all the shared copies of a data item. It keeps track of it with the use of presence bits which denote which caches have a shared copy of a particular block or line in the cache. Each block in memory has a corresponding line in the directory which keeps track of that particular block of memory and which caches have a copy. There is also a dirty bit to indicate when the single copy is the only copy of a particular block anywhere in the machine. So one of two situations exist. Either are, there are one or more presence bits on, indicating if there's more than one, that the copy is shared by multiple readers and exists in multiple caches. Or the dirty bit is on, and there is a single copy with one presence bit indicating the location of that copy. Now, how do these directories maintain coherency? Well, the next two slides will tell us about that. When a location is read, the reader, the processor doing the reading, causes the directory to be updated to indicate that that processor has a copy of that particular cache line. That basically tracks the readers. Then when a location is written, the directory does two things. First. It grants ownership to the writer. That is, it determines which of all the processes that may want to write get priority in trying to write this data item. It grants the ownership, and then using the presence bits contained in the directory, 
causes the other copies to be invalidated and eliminated from the cache. The advantages of this approach are that it has no unnecessary broadcasts and it imposes no restrictions on the topology or the ordering of messages sent around the interconnection network. Directory schemes actually predate Snoopy based schemes, but they were passed over. They were passed over because the Snoopy schemes are simpler and because for most multiprocessors built, scaling hasn't been an issue. People have been interested in smaller scale multiprocessors. In order to explore larger scale machines with cache coherency, directories and the interest in directories has been revived. In order to scale these directories, two important things have to be done. One is that we have to distribute the directories with the memories. That is, when we have multiple memories, we have to have multiple corresponding directories. If we didn't, then the single directory in the machine would become the bottleneck, and it would be no different from than having a single memory in the machine. We also have to use a scalable directory scheme, one that allows the total size of the machine and processor count and memory to scale up without making the directory overly costly. I'm not going to talk about scalable directory schemes in detail in this talk, although there are several papers have been written on this topic. These distributed directory protocols have now been adopted by a wide variety of machines looking at trying to build scalable cache coherency. The Stanford Dash machine that we're talking about is one of these, but the scalable coherent interface is another example that's proposed as an IEEE standard for interconnecting multiple processors. The MIT Alewife machine uses a scalable directory scheme, as does the Kendall Square KSR1. Now that we've discussed some of the background issues in building scalable single address space machines, I want to talk about the Dash architecture and design in particular. Dash is built around the concept of a distributed directory. It uses individual processors connected to their caches, a memory and directory, which forms a cluster. That cluster is interconnected with the communication network based on the Caltech mesh. I'm using a high bandwidth version of that mesh. A single address space is implemented across the entire machine, even though the physical memories are distributed. For example, the high order bits of every address specify the cluster in which that particular address or word will live. The individual clusters are, in fact, multiprocessors based on silicon graphics 4D340s. And the coherency protocol that's implemented as a Snoopy protocol on that bus is used as part of the overall architecture. Let me give you an idea of what the dash memory hierarchy looks like and define some terminology so we can talk about how the coherency protocol works. At the top level, we have the processor and its two-level cache system. That's part of the Silicon Graphics 4D. The next level of hierarchy is provided by the other caches in the same cluster, which act as super caches via the snooping protocol. If the data is not found for a particular access, either in the processor's caches or the other caches of the processors in that cluster, we go to the home cluster of that particular address. The home cluster, remember, is given by the upper order bits in the address. There are two possible situations here. One is that the home cluster is the same as the cluster that's generating the request. That is, the address is the address of a word in the local memory of that cluster. In which case, of course, we don't need to go across the interconnection network. The other case is that that address belongs to a remote cluster and we have to actually send a request across the interconnection network to that home cluster where the address lives. 
In fact, there's even another possible level in the hierarchy here. Consider the situation when the only copy of a particular word that a processor has requested lives in yet another cluster, neither the local cluster which requested the data nor the home directory, but a third remote cluster, in which case we may have to cross the interconnection network again to go and get that data. Let's look at how this protocol operates when we try to read a cache line which is held dirty in a remote cluster. The access will begin with the local cluster generating a read request. That read request will miss in the local caches and cause a message to be sent across the interconnection network requesting the data to the, from the home cluster. When that message arrives in the home cluster, we'll do a directory lookup to determine where that particular word currently resides in the machine. We'll find out that the word is dirty and resides in a remote cluster. That will cause the home cluster to forward the request to that dirty remote cluster. So a message is actually created, and the address of the data object is forwarded. When it arrives at the dirty remote cluster, that cluster will do a lookup using the Snoopy bus protocols to access the caches in the remote cluster. It will find the data word and transmit it directly back to the original requesting local cluster. This forwarding directly back of the request eliminates the need to keep state in the home cluster and keep track of that message. It also reduces the latency. At the same time, the dirty cluster will also write the data back and generate a write back so that the home cluster will be updated. This will mean that future requests don't need to be forwarded to the dirty cluster, but can just be accessed directly in the home cluster and then the data can be returned to the requesting cluster. Now let's look at the case of a write and see how cache coherency is maintained with a write to a shared data item. When the local cluster sees a write to a shared data item that it does not currently have exclusive access to, it will generate a read exclusive request which is sent to the home directory. The home directory acts as the point of arbitration. If two clusters try to do a write to the same word in a cache or the same cache line at once, those requests will both be forwarded to the home directory and they'll be serialized there. When the home directory gets the request, it replies directly to the local requesting cluster, granting it exclusive access. The cluster can then proceed to do the write. In parallel with granting access, the home cluster also will cause invalidations to be sent out to all the objects which are sharing the data. It uses the presence bits of the directories to determine which clusters have shared copies of the data. Those shared objects will then do invalidations in their individual caches and send acknowledgments back to the local cluster when the invalidations have completed. These acknowledgments allow us to use a more relaxed memory model as well as increase the resiliency of the machine in the face of failure. In addition to the basic mechanism of caches and cache coherency, there are several other features in Dash which are used to reduce latency. I've mentioned the notion of a relaxed memory model. What actually happens in Dash is when a write occurs, the cluster gets the read exclusive acknowledgment and immediately continues. That allows it to actually overlap its execution with the actual process of doing the invalidation to the remote clusters. The writes are then pipelined, basically, and we obtain improved performance from that. By going to a relaxed memory model, we don't need to actually halt the processor until we reach a synchronization point. 
This also allows the compiler more freedom in reordering shared accesses between two synchronization points. The Dash architecture also supports prefetching. It does this by actually including the ability to generate a request to an address which will cause a local copy of that cache line to be brought into the cluster. Then rather than see the long latency of an intercluster reference, it's just obtained locally. One of the important innovations in the Dash prefetching mechanism is that the prefetching is what we sometimes call non-binding. That is, even though a data item is brought locally, its coherency is maintained. So that if it's prefetched early and somebody updates the data item, the semantics are correct and the prefetch purely acts as an optimization. This is quite critical in allowing the compiler or the programmer freedom in placing prefetches. It means you can place a prefetch anywhere you want and you will not change the correct behavior of the program. Dash also includes features to reduce the latency of synchronization operations and also to reduce the bandwidth demands of those synchronization operations. Two examples of that are the queuing locks, which allow us to get improved low latency access to highly contended locks, and a fetch and increment operation, which gives us the ability to reduce the contention on things like queue indices and uh, loop indices. Let me actually show you a diagram of what the Dash hardware looks like here. In this figure, we can see the clusters organized with the multiple processors and the directory in the cluster, as well as I.O. and the portion of the memory. The interconnection network is actually a pair of meshes. One of these is, a re is used for requests, and the other is used for replies. What actually happens in the machine is when a request is generated, the directory recognizing that the request is for a remote address creates a message which it transmits over the request network. That message is routed through the network to the appropriate cluster where the directory at that cluster sees the message as an incoming request. That directory in the target cluster then takes the message off the network, does whatever accesses are required on the bus, and creates a new message containing the data. That message is then sent back out on the reply network, where it is routed through the reply network and back to the original requesting cluster, where again the directory puts that back on the bus. Let's look one level deeper into how the directory controller actually functions. We see here on the bottom the two buses which are the backbone of the cluster, the Silicon Graphics multiprocessor bus. The directory controller actually acts like another snoop on that bus, sitting there watching the bus activity. When the directory controller sees the remote request, it generates a message which it sends out through the message routing chip and through the request network. That message goes around the machine and comes in the request network of the remote cluster. The message then is routed to what we call the pseudo CPU. The pseudo CPU is a piece of logic which acts on behalf of a remote requester, as if it were a daemon sitting on the bus. It generates the necessary bus control signals to get the data either from memory or from the cache of one of the processors on that bus. When the access is completed, the directory controller picks up the data from the bus and sends the message containing the requested data back out through the message routing chip on the reply network. A piece of logic in the original requesting cluster called the reply controller keeps track of all outstanding requests. When the outstanding request returns to the cluster, the reply controller places the data back on the network and tells the processor that it can now proceed with execution. What's important is that this entire process is totally transparent. A program issues a load instruction, and the hardware does this entire mechanism, including the creation of messages, routing them through the network, 
getting the data and providing the data back to the processor. The dash design also includes a rather substantial performance monitor to try to monitor and watch the behavior of programs. This allows us not only to have a machine which can execute parallel programs, but to actually have an environment for studying parallel programs and watching how they behave. Overall, in terms of gate count, this coherency mechanism adds about 10% in the gate count to the individual cluster. So the overhead is actually quite modest. Now let me show you a picture of what the DASH prototype looks like. Uh, we've implemented this using state-of-the-art academic packaging. Uh, we've actually removed the board supports that we use in this figure, uh, which normally consist of old phone books and TTL catalogs. Uh, the design is actually done so that the directory logic slips right into the Silicon Graphics backplane. With the help of Silicon Graphics, we were able to make a number of small but critical modifications to their processor environment so that the processor can correctly operate with the directory board in its backplane. The message network is actually implemented over the ribbon cables that are visible in this picture. Now let me say something about the performance of these remote accesses in this machine. This figure shows you the breakdown of the time to do a local fill of a cache, that is a, to fill a cache miss which has occurred on the local bus, a two cluster fill, that is the time to do a cache miss which has to go to one remote cluster, and finally a three cluster fill, the time to do a cache miss that has to go to two remote clusters. A local fill takes just over 20 processor clocks. And you can see the breakdown with that time almost evenly divided between memory access time and bus overhead. One of the surprising things you'll see in both the two and three cluster fill, which take respectively about 100 and 130 processor clocks, is that a substantial amount of the time is devoted to getting through the memory hierarchy onto the bus and in and out of clusters. A rather small amount of the time overall is devoted to actually getting through the network. This actually has some important advantages. It means that in larger scale machines, the network time will still not be the major bottleneck in the design. Let me also observe that although one might think that these times of 100 processor clocks to go to a remote uh, cluster or 130 to go through two remote clusters sound large, that in fact we expect that next generation versions of this architecture, we will be hard pressed to maintain those processor clock ratios given the rapid improvement in CPU performance. So we believe that these are realistic numbers and numbers that real designs and programs have to live with. So given that, one might ask the question, if remote accesses can take 100 to 130 processor clocks, what's the performance of this machine going to look like on real interesting applications? Well, I guess I wouldn't be here today if the performance wasn't interesting. So on this slide, I'm going to show you some numbers that have been captured on the 16 processor prototype for Dash. These numbers are for a wide range of applications, varying from things that do radiosity calculations for graphics to a variety of scientific programs that do galaxy evolution, fluid flow, the classic matrix multiply, as well as more scientific, more engineering oriented programs that do things like placement and route by simulated annealing. You'll notice the speed up for most, for a wide range of these problems is actually quite good. And what I'd like to do is show you some reason why the performance on one of these programs is particularly good and why on one of them, namely the one on the bottom of the chart, MP3D, the performance is not so good. This next photograph shows a picture 
of our real-time monitoring system, which actually enables us to watch what's happening on the machine in real time using the performance monitor to capture data. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see four windows which correspond to the four clusters and tell you what the remote access latency from those four, in those four clusters looks like. And you can see that the times are quite, quite tightly packed together, indicating that not very much contention is occurring in the machine. On the right-hand side, you can see four windows that tell you how much idle time exists in each one of the processors with the large green bar indicating that the processors are busy most of the time, roughly 90 to 95 percent of the time in this application. So this application, which is simulating dynamic, molecular dynamics in a water molecule, actually gets quite good speed up. Let's look at what this kind of performance monitor tells us about the program, which doesn't get good speed up, MP3D. If we look at this shot of the screen, we'll see two things. On the left hand side, we can see that there is quite a lot of contention in the machine. And rather than have a sharply focused remote access time, we've got a remote access time which is smoothed out and blurred out. And we see that the average remote access times are considerably larger than what the minimum latency is, indicating that there's a lot of contention in the machine. We also can see on the right-hand side that three of the four clusters are idle almost 50% of the time. That is, the processor utilization is only about 60%. And hence, that's why we're not getting very good speed up on this application. Now let me return to this performance chart for a second and say something about this. The MP3D application was originally written for a vector supercomputer. And it actually effectively streams its entire memory image, a three-dimensional representation of space, through the processor. One of the things we did was to rewrite this application. And the version of it that's been rewritten is called PSIM4. PSIM4 is actually a more sophisticated version of this application in that it includes more complicated chemistry uh, of the upper, upper atmosphere. However, it obtains substantially better performance, as we can see on this chart. And it does that because PSIM4 pays more attention to locality of access and uses a more sophisticated data structure to improve its locality of access. So we see that with some work, we can even obtain performance on a program whose performance was initially quite dismal. Let me say something about the software strategy which we're developing for this machine. One focus of that software strategy is compiler-directed parallelism and hierarchy, memory hierarchy management, whereby the compiler analyzes scientifically oriented programs consisting primarily of, of loop-intensive programs, and both decomposes the parallelism to run in parallel and manages the memory hierarchy, aggressively tries to improve the locality of memory access. We're also developing languages which are aimed at parallel programs which have a larger grain size and which also have a more complicated model of memory locality. These languages, Jade and Cool, both have ways for users to talk about data dependencies between parallel tasks as well as to deal with the issue of locality. One of the nice things about a machine like Dash that has a single address space is that there's a fairly straightforward strategy for getting an operating system on it. We took a version of the Silicon Graphics IRIX operating system and ported it quite easily to Dash. Some small performance tuning was done in order to enable the machine to operate more effectively with multiple clusters. But the important thing is that it runs Unix in a multi-threaded environment in a way that most of us like. We've also focused quite heavily on trying to build tools to help people tune their programs and make them run effectively on, on a machine like Dash. This is particularly important because the memory hierarchy, as we've seen earlier, is quite sophisticated. And explaining this to a programmer who hasn't had several courses in computer architecture can be quite difficult. In order to assist them, one of the tools we've built is a tool called mTool, 
mTool actually tracks the behavior of a program and keeps track of where the performance bottlenecks are. So it can tell you in a particular procedure, for example, that there's a memory bottleneck or a synchronization bottleneck, which is preventing you from obtaining good speed up. Uh, mTool not only can do that, but it can isolate the actual lines in the source code. And it has a fully windowed interface to enable you to go directly from the memory bottleneck to the particular set of lines in source code, which are the source of that bottleneck. This allows users to quickly focus in on what the problem in their program is and allows them to tune it. Now let me say a little bit about what we see for future opportunities, future versions of the Dash architecture. One thing we've been looking at is a much more highly integrated version of this architecture that would use newer processors. One could use modern packaging technology to design a four processor cluster which with ASICs and tight packaging technology could put the four processors with their first and second level caches, 128 megabytes of memory, an ASIC based directory controller, new state of the art interconnection network using new mesh routing chips, all together onto a single board. Using processors that are available in 1992, you could obtain a peak performance of 600 MIPS out of that cluster and about 400 megaflops. If you took this highly integrated cluster and placed it into a tightly packed system environment, you could place a 1,000 processor machine, that is a 16 by 16 grid with four processors per cluster, into four large racks. With today's processors, that might give you a peak performance of about 600 GIPS and about 400 gigaflops. But what's perhaps even more exciting is that if you took processors which we expect to be available in the 93-94 time frame, you could obtain a machine which would have about 1.6 teraflops of peak performance. Let me now make some concluding remarks about the Dash design. What Dash tries to do is combine some of the scalability advantages that have been demonstrated and associated with message passing machines together with the programming advantages that we know from a single address space machine. It does that with the use of a distributed directory protocol. We see that Dash looks like the beginning of a convergence between these two approaches, the message based approach and the single address space approach and hopefully has some of the advantages of both. Let me say, though, that a single address space, while it eases the programming effort, does not allow the programmer to ignore and forget about locality. So that to really use these machines, we'll need new algorithms that have scalable parallelism, that pay attention to locality, that help us make use of latency tolerating support and help us minimize global synchronization. The DASH project has been a large project for us by academic standards and wouldn't have been possible without the help of a lot of people. My colleagues at Stanford have played a big role in making this machine work. Professors Gupta, Horowitz, and Lamb have all made invaluable contributions. Dave Nakahira, our staff engineer, has actually helped keep the hardware together and make it really run. A large number of PhD students have contributed to both the hardware and software system. Dan Lenowski and Jim Loudon were key designers on this project. And finally, I want to thank Silicon Graphics, without whom, whose help we could have never built a working prototype of this scale and demonstrated the viability of these ideas. Thank you. <laughs>